What happens when we die? Maybe this book has the answers. Welcome, my mere mortalites, to another round of the Mere Mortals book reviews. My name is Kyron, host of the Mere Mortals podcast, but also this one where I dive deeper into the books that I'm reading to give you the juicy information to find some themes that might be here and maybe even some answers, which we potentially could find today in this book, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, also known as the Bardo Tholdol, and written by Padmasam Bhava. Oof, I'm going to mispronounce a lot of these Tibetan names. Please bear with me. So this was written in the 8th century AD and it's got a fairly complex history behind it, which I'll get on to soon. And it's a hidden Tibetan text that explains the Bardo, which is this intermediate zone between death and rebirth. So it's mostly to be used as a companion guide. So it actually has a relatively practical streak for it. So it's addressed to the uh, people who are helping a, a loved one who is dying. So the caregivers and perhaps even the priests. And then also for the, the dying person themselves as to what to expect in these separate zones that they're going through. So there is uh, four parts in this and each of these is contained within two books. So book number one, the Chikai Bardo and the Chonyad Bardo. And this has part one, the Bardo of the moments of death. So right as we are dying. And then part two, the Bardo of the experiencing of reality. So kind of what is reality and how do you almost know that you're dying? We then go to book two, the Sidpa Bardo. And this is split into part one, the after death world. So this is right in that transition zone. And then part two, the process of rebirth, what to expect as we are being reborn. So quite a few things in there and it definitely is really highlighting this transition period. So it's like, this is what you will see on day one. This is what you'll see on day three. Uh, you, you know, use these techniques to ha help meditate and whatnot. So you, there's quite a, a few things and it really goes from the good to the bad. So it usually starts off in the first kind of 14 days. You know, things are okay-ish or I suppose the first couple of days. And then as we get further on, it's like, hellish deities are starting to appear, um, you're going to start experiencing what might be called hell in the Christian religion. And so we definitely see it's like, oh, okay, it's not getting as, as nice here. So we'll get onto that soon. Now, who was Padmasambhava and what was the, the history, I guess, of the Tibetan Book of the Dead? So it was written in Nijali uh, by his I suppose, favored student. So this is Yoshe, Yeshe Tsyogol. <laughs> and this was in the 8th century AD. And it, this was like a hidden text and, and it was revealed by Kama Lingpa in the 14th century AD. So it was kind of in, I don't know exactly where, scrolls or texts or a cave, or, you know, it's usually in these sort of areas. Uh, and then refound and then people are like, oh, this has a lot of tremendous value. Like, will, this will become more popular again. It was kind of rediscovered, I guess, for the West in the 19, early 19th, uh, 1900s, so early 20th century. And this was by a man of the name, Evan, oh, gonna have to try and find, Evan Wentz, Evan Wentz, uh, who uh, went to Tibet and, and these sorts of areas, found it and was translated by Lama Kazi Dawa Sumbup and with an introduction by John Baldock. So <laughs> very complex history with all of this. I'm going to get onto the first theme, which is liberation. So this is steel manning the Bardo. So I'm going to do my best to present Bardo and the Bardo Thodol in a, in a positive light and, and what I think it might be trying to um, really aim to, to show. And so there's a basic starting point and this is well, what is the Bardo well, and how can meaning and practicality be found from this? So if I jump onto page 11, there's a decent explanation. So the Bardo Thodo or the Bardo Thoskrol. Evan once mention of the Bardo ritual reminds us that the Tibetan text we now know as the Tibetan Book of the Dead had a practical rather than literary purpose. So the Tibetan term Bardo means between two or intermediate and refers to the intermediate state or Bardo between life and rebirth. Evan once says, Tibetan text is in fact one of the one of many funerary texts known as the Bardo Thodo or Bardo Thoskrol, meaning liberation through hearing in the intermediate state, which were read aloud in the presence of a dying or recently deceased person. So there we go. It is this kind of uh, helpful thing that is used for not only the, the dying, the dead, but also the loved ones. And so there is this practicality 
that is quite nice that you can find from this book because it is sort of a how-to on 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 dying in in many ways so it does explain okay you know if you've got someone and they're in this kind of delirious state and they're perhaps passing from life into death and then into rebirth this is how you know you should read this on this particular day when they're showing these symptoms um, and I, I can see how this would give a a very assurance in, in a manner in a manner so it I think a lot of this book is actually directed towards the caregiver. So it is saying, read this aloud to this person. When they're experiencing this, they perhaps might be showing these sort of symptoms. You know, this is probably why, because they're experiencing this state. So it's almost like an explanation, a, a soothing type of thing. And then also for the dying, it gives you, okay, assurances. This is what you what to expect. This is what you're going to see. So we can see this on the bottom of page 88 so the conclusion showing the fundamental importance of the bardo teachings whatever the religious practices of anyone may have been whether extensive or, li or limited during the moments of death various misleading illusions occur and hence this third oil is indispensable to those who have meditated much the real truth dawneth as soon as the body and consciousness principle part the acquiring of experience while living is important. They who have then recognized the true nature of their own being and thus have had some experience obtaineth great power during the bardo of the moments of death when the clear light dawneth. And then it does go on to talk about meditation and how you can train this and how even I suppose it's good for not only lay people but also for the very experience. So it can be used um, a, applicably across a, a broad the, the board the broader spectrum I, I guess i guess for all tibetan people and maybe there's claims on this is how it is for everyone else in the world i'm not too sure of that that's maybe stepping a little bit beyond this so we do get this hinted at right then the illusions there's going to be many illusions and, and fear and so this is sort of makes sense to me when you're dying you are going to be experiencing pain most likely you are going to be going from a, a, a known state, i.e. life and consciousness into this unknown state of non-consciousness, or at least that's what it appears to be from the outside. Uh, altered perceptions, so your hearing, your sight, your taste, your smell, your the feeling of your body, they're all probably going to change. And this can be uh, a very, uh, I imagine, a very complex uncertain anxiety provoking time and so there's bad things are, are somewhat coming or at least changes are coming and, and humans tend to struggle with change but there is a, a somewhat of a call to courage so uh, it's it's almost like hey you can do this you you'll be able to do this so uh on the ninth day on this is on page 74 it's talking about how you you're going to be starting to experience like these deities who are going to come and so this is the bhagavan vajra haruka dark blue in color with three faces six hands and four feet firmly postured in the first right hand holding a doge in the middle one a skull bowl and the last a battle axe and so it's got all of these kind of pictures as well that come with it of these um, deities with multiple arms holding weapons and uh, you you would say probably an imposing somewhat scary uh of face or picture and after all of this explanation of what you'll see it says fear it not be not terrified be not awed know it to be the embodiment of thine own intellect as it is thine own tutelary deity be not terrified in reality they are the bhagavan vajra sattva the father and mother believe in them recognizing them liberation will be attained at once by so proclaiming them knowing them to be tutelary deities merging in them in one in at one mint buddhahood will be obtained so it's really giving you this assurance hey you're going to be experiencing these crazy things you can still find liberation you can still find nirvana or buddhahood or um, however you want to phrase it and it's i guess this this assurance that hey bad things are going to happen but you can still get through this like you you can do it you can do it be not terrified um don't don't fear or don't don't be uh don't lose your senses and your wits just because you are experiencing what you might think is a setback so i guess the answer to a lot of the dying and death process that the the bardo dodo comes up with is meditation and so it does say there's a constant reminder throughout the book meditate on this dispel this illusion you can do this and 
it's it's sort of like it almost reminds me of the book uh, Meditations on First Philosophy by Descartes where he, he goes down this kind of step of series of processes to find out, okay, what is true? What is the, the deepest basis truth? And I think meditation is a very good tool for doing this because it is somewhat dispelling of these internal negative thoughts that you're having, of illusions of what you think other people might think, of actually experiencing your senses. What actually can I smell at this very moment in time? What can I hear? What can I feel? Is this actually reality? And I guess, is this actually as bad as maybe my, my brain is want is, is tricking me into thinking, uh, you know, these, these very complex, um, delusional type things that we have. And I, th I think this book is, is probably pretty good at, at highlighting, Hey, you, if, if you're going through these processes, you found utility probably in life of, of meditating and, and, you know, dispelling some illusions that were perhaps in life this is probably going to be useful in this intermediate bardo zone between life and rebirth. And so it gets into uh, how you can use this. And there, there is just this constant reminder. It's almost like the gong or the ding of a bell, you know, tune in at this moment. What is this? What am I experiencing? Is this, um, am I making this worse than it needs to be? So that I suppose is my, my steel manning of the bardo of, of why this book is, is useful and, and how, uh, it could have some very positive benefits for people who are dying, not only the dying people, but also the loved ones of dying ones. But okay, let's get on to the, the other side of the spectrum. This is control, criticizing religion. So one of the things I struggled with reading this book was I suppose the independent verification. Is this true? How can I know this is what is going to be experienced? This is what I'll experience and this is going to be uniform through most of humanity, if not all of us. And it's extremely detailed, but there's no explanations of origins. It's not talking about where this uh, Mother Vajra Kronti Asharuma with her right hand clinging to blah, 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 blah. It doesn't come, it doesn't say why these, these things exist or why they're appearing. It just says, this is what, what's going to happen. And... So why, why does it come up with all of these things? And, and is there a way to independently verify this? Well, not until I die. And so that's a kind of a one way street. I can't really do that in this life. So cynically, if I was going to have to be the, the most cynical, I would say it's about control. There's very many instances where it says, okay, um, you should get good karma in your life because if you don't get good karma, you're going to go to bloody hell. So if I jump over to 106 and 107 of the, the book, pages 106 and 107, we have this section here where it's it's talking about the judgment. And so, you know, it says, oh, nobly born so-and-so. So this is your, you're reading this out to the deceased person. So, oh, nobly born so-and-so, listen. That thou art suffering, so cometh from thine own karma. It is not due to anyone else's. It is by thine own karma. Accordingly, pray earnestly to the precious trinity that will protect thee. And then it's talking about how you can pray and whatnot. And then it's talking about how you will probably attempt to tell lies and say, I've not committed any evil deed. Uh, and then it's going on to what the Lord of death is going to do. So then the Lord of death will say, I will consult the mirror of karma. So saying he will look in the mirror wherein every good and evil act is vividly reflected. Lying will be of no avail. Then one of the executive furies of the Lord of death will place round thy neck a rope and drag thee along. He will cut off thy head, extract thy heart, pull out thy intestines, lick up thy brain, drink thy blood, eat thy flesh, gnaw thy bones, but thou wilt be incapable of dying. Although thy body be hacked to pieces, it will revive again. The repeated hacking will cause intense pain and torture. Oi. <laughs> so it's pretty clear. Okay, if you don't have good karma in your life, you're going to experience some pretty messed up stuff. And so it's, it's talking about all of this and how, uh, thankfully in their religion, hell is not an eternal thing. So even if you do bad stuff, you'll eventually get out of hell and back into the rebirth um, process. But you'll spend a hell of a, a long time there as well. So in this case, I, if cynically I would go, okay, well, what do you actually need to do for good karma? You know, there's probably going to be aspects of you have to do in this, this, you probably have to, you know, help support 
Um, I know, in fact, you are to get good karma. You are meant to support, you know, the monks and the, uh, I suppose, the the more religiously minded people, and you are meant to kind of pay a tithing or, or, or donations to them and whatnot when they come by your village, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's that aspect. Maybe in a less cynical portion, I would say it's kind of just silly, to be honest. There's definitely parts that are basically gibberish. It's very hard to, to understand and there's so much repetition. So if I go here onto page 65, uh, this is an area where it's talking about the seventh day. So on the seventh day, all of these things happen and then it's like, oh, nobly born, listen undistractedly. On the seventh day, the very, uh, very colored radiance of the purified propensities will come to shine. So I don't know what that means. Simultaneously, the knowledge holding deities from the holy paradise realms will come to receive one. And then it's got a full page where it repeats, okay, from the center of the circle to the east of the circle, to the south of that circle, to the west of that circle, to the north of that circle, in the outer circle. And for each of these circles, there's going to be the deity called the earth abiding knowledge holder, white of color with radiant smiling countenance, embraced by the white Dakini, the divine mother, he holding a crescent knife and a skull filled with blood, dancing and making the mudra of fascination with his right hand held aloft will come to shine. And then on the next one, it'll talk about this other one who is now yellow. Then it will talk about this other one who is red. And then it will talk about this one who is green and it's half angry and half smiling instead of uh, radiantly smiling. <laughs> it just, it's, it's just so repetitive and gibberish that it, I go, okay, well, why is this like this? Um, maybe it's to confuse people. Maybe there is some symbolism behind this, but it's certainly not readily apparent right on the surface maybe you do need to have a whole cultural context of living in tibet and buddhism and, and and whatnot and then finally maybe on a more neutral point of the this criticizing religion uh, it it can be interesting and fun but i'm not sure this is actually great for making the biggest life changes and adhering to certain principles in your life so if i go on to page 65 um Sorry. Um, yeah, no, different, uh, different page. I should have been going to page uh, 73, page 73. And it's talking, this is still on the seventh day, uh, mind you. Um, actually, no, we've just passed over into the eighth day. And so it's talking about the great glorious Buddha Haruka, dark brown of color with three heads, six hands, four feet firmly postured, the right being white. And it's going over this, giving vent to sonorous utterances of ah la 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 and ha ha <laughs> and piercing whistling sounds. Uh, it's talking about how it's holding a battle ax, a bowl, a skull bowl, all of these things, you know, a clashing sound, rumbling sound as loud as thunder. And it's giving all this stuff and then, you know, straighten and on a day supported by horn eagles will come forth from within thine own brain and shine vividly upon thee. Fear that not be not awed. <laughs> it's just so, so, so crazy. It's like giving all of these detailed, extremely nuanced, you know, I could basically see the great, uh, glorious Buddha Haruka in front of me. And then it's, it's talking about, you know, something you would never experience in everyday life. And then it's like, oh yeah, but don't be awed, fear that not. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. There's, there's so much of this where it, I just go, I can see the negatives here. I can see how all of this seems either unnecessary and if I was to put a more cynical light on it, very controlling and forcing you to do things and believe things which are very hard to independently verify, which is what I have noticed in some of my other previous readings. The more I go down into the actual texts of Buddhism, there is a lot that talks about a lot of repetition, a lot of talking about what monks can and can't do involving caterpillars of why monks get erections of stories of why you can't wear this robe or this robe or why doing this thing on this day or having sex with this mutilated body is a bad thing to do. It's like, okay, is this all, all necessary? Maybe, but for me, it, it seems overkill. So let's go into my own observations and takeaways. Uh, there is no doubt of the beauty of this book. There's only one observation I've really had from this, but I, I would be proud to own this book. I get all my books from the library and, and um, I don't particularly keep them, but the style of this, so it is filled with um, pictures throughout of these very detailed images and 
I, I just really enjoy seeing this. The even just the, the the layout, the design, even the material of the book just feels really nice. It's really, really well put together. And I would say a lot of the words in this as well, they do if I was in a more poetical mindset, I would say, oh, that that does sound nice. And this, of course, being a translation, so it probably sounds even better in the original Tibetan. I'm not not sure what um, they actually speak there or Sanskrit or whatever. And so there is this appeal to me of the the design aspect, the the kind of cultural symbol, the artistic beauty, perhaps. I, I do see a fair chunk of that in this book and I, I can appreciate that somewhat. So let's go to my summary. A large part of religion is finding meaning with some practicality attached. Uh, at least I personally believe that. And I personally found this book mostly useless. There wasn't anything that really I could take out of it. There was so much just talking about deities, which I'd never heard of before, of symbolism, which didn't make sense to me. And I, I guess it did get me thinking about the logistics of actually dying, of going, oh, okay, maybe it would be important to know what experiences a loved one might go through. What perhaps will I experience if I get into a car crash or if I have you know, a cancer that's coming up or, or these sorts of things, maybe it is useful to, to know more about um, palliative care or, or that kind of deathbed caring. And I have read some books on that before and, and maybe I should dive into that a little bit more because it would be reassuring both for me and then also as, as the dyer, but then also perhaps as a person, uh, as being as a caregiver, because I do have elderly parents and, and things like that maybe that would be useful to know. So I appreciate Buddhism more than most religions, but I, I just draw the line at deities and unverifiable claims. I, I really do struggle with those things. So overall, I'm giving the Tibetan Book of the Dead a two and a half out of 10. That's not my jam. It's not my jam, but I, I hope others can get some um, goodness from it. So that is it for today by Mere Mortalites. Thank you for joining in, tuning in to this episode of the Mere Mortals Book Reviews. What are your thoughts on Buddhism, on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, on the Bardo Thodol? Do you know the great Buddha Haruka and, and have you experienced, um, I suppose, benefits from this book? I would love to, to know all of those things. Best way to do that is dropping a comment down below. And then I also explain more of my thoughts on these books in the end of month book recap. So if you want to know more, some additional details perhaps that didn't make it into here. That's worth checking out that. And then also the Mere Mortals podcast because that's where I go into a little bit more depth and uh, explain some of these concepts in a more conversational style with my friend Juan. So I really do hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the process of dying or rebirth or in the bardo. And until the next time, see you.